show, the J. Craig Podcast. And we're live. JCraig.com. Craig. Jason, what is going on? <laughs> I am right. We are back. Let's do it. What should we talk about? Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the J. Craig Podcast. I'm Jay. And I'm going to be running solo today. So, Craig has had some technical difficulties out in the desert oasis. So, unfortunately, he's been unable to record with me. And instead of having weeks and weeks go by with no new content, I thought I'd jump on here and have a quick conversation with you fine people who are listening to J. Craig and hopefully give you your J. Craig fix, if that's such a thing. And if it's a thing, you came to the right place. Now, since we're already halfway through the first month of the new year, I thought we should talk about what I call the barren wasteland that is January. Now, of course, I'm talking cinematically, uh, despite the fact that I live in a frozen tundra as we speak. Uh, But to give you a little bit of uh, perspective on this, uh, I did some research, and the two movies that caught my eye the most that have come out during the month of January... One was Tremors, starring the amazing Fred Ward, and From Dusk Till Dawn. So that just gives you a little perspective on the quality of movies that have come out during uh, the, the month of January. And typically there's a reason for that. You have the Oscar push that's always late into you know, the previous year. And then over the last several years, you've had a big Star Wars movie come out during uh, December. And so that kind of, well, that doesn't kind of, that definitely eats into a lot of January. So most companies stay far away from that time frame. Um, however, that's about to change right now. As I'm looking at the schedule of uh, things coming out in January, I'm pleasantly surprised that I'm going to be going back to the theater very soon. So we have the first of two Steven Spielberg movies coming out this January. It actually, already came out last week, uh, at least in this area. And that's called The Post. Now, that's with Tom Hanks and Meryl Streep. So um, here's the funny thing is we've got two movies for Spielberg this year, man. That's awesome because that's that's going to be a good year right off the bat. Typically, he does his lower uh, scale movie, his more personal tale uh, earlier in the year during this kind of year, maybe December, January time frame, um, and that's the post. And then he follows it up with his big blockbuster movie, his summer movie, if you will, um, uh, th- as a second movie. And this year we're getting Ready Player One, which I'm going to touch on a little bit later. So uh, we have the post. Now, there's another movie coming out, which if you haven't heard about it, you're probably going to want to see it as soon as I tell you about it. It's called The Phantom Thread. Now, it doesn't sound all that interesting, except the fact that it's directed by Paul Thomas Anderson and starring Daniel Day-Lewis. Let that sink in for a minute. Paul Thomas Anderson, Daniel Day-Lewis, right? Come on. We've seen that before with There Will Be Blood. And if you haven't seen There Will Be Blood, you need to watch There Will Be Blood. It's fantastically acted, directed. There's very little dialogue, and that dialogue that's in there is so powerful. Such a good movie. Um, So this movie, I don't even care what it's about. He has my utmost respect as a filmmaker and as an actor, both those two guys. So I'm going to see that without a doubt this coming weekend. Um, I'm going to follow that one up with the other movie that's coming out this year, or I think it's actually also next week is uh, a western which is right up my alley it's christian bale all right we're on a good on a, on a good path right now it's called hostiles and it deals with the cavalry native americans and i'm sure there'll be a lot of uh you know social injustice cues going on that are going on today in this movie uh, but that looks pretty cool and very violent um that's a lot of movies to see so i might not catch that in the theater i think i'm going to be seeing the post and phantom thread before i see Hostiles. so that one might lose out and be gone before i'm able to see it um, now, one that I would like and I wish I wanted to see is Guillermo del Toro's uh, The Shape of Water. Now, uh, I'm not a big fan of uh, Guillermo del Toro. If you've listened to the J. Craig before, we've talked about this, and I think we just talked about it recently, is that I just don't like him as a filmmaker. I liked his early Spanish stuff, like his uh, The Devil's Backbone and Pan's Labyrinth, which I don't know, it was right on the border of his American movies or Hollywood movies versus Spanish movies. So I'm not sure where it falls, but those two movies for me are just like, that what really got me interested in Del Toro was those two movies. But everything since then has never really amounted to much for me. Now, visually, he's a fantastic uh, storyteller, but he's not a very good storyteller. You know what I'm saying? He just, his characters are very weak. They're one note. Um, 
the the story just doesn't really tries to go someplace but doesn't because you don't care about the characters. So his movies never really fully work for me, and I think it's mostly because it's the Hollywood movies. Um, again, the other stuff I think I like more, but um, I've heard a lot about The Shape of Water, and so I'm actually very interested in seeing it now. So again, might miss it in the theater, but I'll catch it when it comes up on Amazon or Netflix uh, down the road. Uh, so not a bad way to start off the year, right? So you ended off with Star Wars. We had a really kickoff end of the year with Blade Runner, uh, Justice League, Thor 3, and then Star Wars. No matter what you thought about the last movie there, that's a good end of the year. And the fact that we had a Star Wars movie is a really good, you know, good exclamation to the year. Um, but then, you know, you go into January and you're like, eh, nothing's coming out till like February or March, but we got some good solid material. So get out to the theaters, go support the movies and go see those three movies if you can, at least one of them, right? Uh, like I'm going to try to get two. So thinking about that, let's, let's talk about this. I don't want to talk about year for year right now. I don't want to go into the whole, um, well, I'm not year for year, but month by month, like what's coming out this year. I don't want to do a, uh, a look ahead. But I do want to touch on things I'm looking forward to seeing, if you don't mind. So let's let's talk about this if, if we can for a minute. Okay, you ready? Okay, so we know that there is a new Avengers movie coming out. That's probably the biggest movie of the year. Um, now, if you've listened to the J. Craig, you know that I'm, we, Craig and I, are not big Marvel movie fans. But we our interest, and especially mine, has been renewed with stuff like the Russo's work. Uh, and then the last uh, Thor movie, and even Doctor Strange, I really like that movie too. So there's a lot of good movies of recent that have come out that have uh, increased my uh, anticipation of their movies and of their stories. And what's cool about the Avengers Infinity War that's coming out right around the same time that another movie, a big budget movie is coming out, um, I'll talk about that in a second, but I digress. So with Infinity Wars, I'm interested in it because it's taken a long time to get to this point. It's obviously going to be the end of the line for a lot of characters. So, uh, folks, anyone out there who hasn't, you know, doesn't know anything about Infinity War, please stop listening. Or if you don't care, you don't care. But I, I don't, I'm not an expert on my comic books. I'll leave that to my buddy Bob and Mike. But for my purposes, I know that a lot of people die. A lot of characters die at the end of this movie, or should at the end of this movie. And if you look at the contracts of Junior, or da- Downey Jr., and uh, Evans, and um, Chris Helmsworth, I think they all are kind of like, this is it. I think this is like their last movie. And so if that's true, these characters should be dying as they should and rebirthing into something else because I have a feeling like Dr. Strange will do something at the end, which will reverse time or bring you back in time. And then I think the next movie after, um, well, we get Black Panther coming out first, but then, um, the next movie after Infinity Wars, I think is Captain Marvel, which is kind of, from what I understand, it's kind of resetting the timeline. And depending on how the movie ends in Infinity War, if it goes back in time, if they do a little, like, you know, uh, he messes with the time um, thing that, you know, Doctor Strange can do, perhaps we go back in time and we start almost start the timeline over. And what I find fascinating about this, I'm actually really anticipating the uh, Captain Marvel movie because I think they're dealing with scrolls. And if you don't know what the scrolls are, you need to go pick up a book of uh, Avengers Ultimate. I, I hope I got that right. Craig, not Craig, uh, Bob, Mike, do I got that right? Is it the Ultimates, which has a, the the, the uh, scrolls? Or something different. might be something totally different. Um, but I, 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 like I said, I'm not an expert, but I have read some of this stuff. And the scrolls are aliens that are shapeshifters, and they um, infiltrate organizations. So, like, you have Avengers who end up being scrolls. So we might learn that towards the end of the Avenger, uh, Infinity War or find out some of the characters that we thought we loved and were good guys were ultimately aliens at the end of the day or at least at the beginning of the day, right? So I'm really looking forward to what they do with the Infinity War bringing into and then keep going into Marvel, Captain Marvel movie. So that's kind of cool. Uh, and then thankfully, it's the Russo brothers. So they've really increased my interest as filmmakers on what they can do with it. So I'm really looking forward to seeing what the Infinity Wars is. Now, the one I think that can't miss this year is Steven Spielberg's second movie of this year. That's right. He has two. You get the post earlier uh, here in January. And then this summer, you're going to get Ready Player One. Ready Player One is written by, the novel was written by Ernest Klein, And it takes place in a bleak future where everyone's kind of crammed together, no one's happy, of course. And then you have this virtual reality getaway, which is called the Oasis. And it's it's run by this one guy. He's like the Amazon guy or, you know, the, the Google guy or Facebook guy. He, he's this guy who's just the biggest, most richest guy because of this system that he has, this, this game he has. And everyone goes in there 
can be they can be whatever you want, right? So you have all these '80s and '90s pop culture references. So it's right up my alley, and I don't know if it's gonna hit everyone the same way because you know it, they're not gonna get all the '80 references, and I might not get all the the more recent references that they throw in there, whether it's video games or movies or you know they have Freddy Krueger and and Chucky and uh, Iron Giant and the A Team car, the van, and the Ecto-1, right? So you have all these pop culture references smashed into one movie, and it just looks awesome. Plus, the fact that it's made by Spielberg. This is like right up his alley, and just a perfect combination for a summer blockbuster movie. So I am super stoked for Ready Player One. One that I'm probably most excited about as a pure movie, not an experience, but as a like a cinematic, like a, just a proper movie, is the Sicario sequel, Soldado. Um, Tremendously excited about that because I kind of forgot it was being made. Uh, Deli, Denny Velenu is not directing the movie, but the writer, um, oh, cripes, I can't remember his name. Uh, the, the 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 awesome writer who uh, who who directed and writ, wrote um, uh, Wind River. Uh, he's back at it with Sicario again, and uh, Taylor Sheridan. There it is. And then somebody else is, so they're all, there's good people attached to it. So I'm looking forward to seeing it. the trailer looks awesome. It follows the path of, um, uh, Benicio and Josh Brolin. And to, so Emily Blunt's story is over. She's not in this movie from what I can tell. And it's not about her. It's about them and what their story is. So really cool. Now I should raise up a big point here. If you have not seen Sicario to this day, you need to do yourself a favor and you have a homework assignment from the J. Craig. Go rent a Sicario. It's phenomenal. I, I highly recommend it by the J. Craig. Okay, one other one I'm looking forward to, which I'm only looking forward to because of the actor, and that's Venom. So uh, it's not tied into the Spider-Man movie. It's not tied into the Spider-Man universe in, in, in cinematically, cinematically, but it's a, it's a Spider-Man villain. So I don't know what the fuck's going on with this one, man. I'm like, why are they making this? Why? What are they doing with this movie, man? It sounds like a stupid idea. But then you throw Tom Hardy in the mix, and I'm like, all right, I'll go see it. <laughs> so, so I'm totally gonna go see it because I love Tom Hardy. I have a man crush. I can't, I can't help it. Uh, but I just, I, I don't understand why, man. Uh, whatever, whatever. Now the other one that. I think it's going to be one of those sneaky ones that comes in that you don't really hear about until the word of mouth is uh, Quiet Place. Now, this is the one with um, Jim from The Office, John uh, Krasinski. Um, he's in it, and I don't recall who the his wife is. But this is really cool because the trailer really sells it for me. It does a proper job of selling it and giving you enough without giving you everything. And it dealt with uh, a family who has a deaf child, a deaf child, so they know sign language. And that comes in really handy because something happens to the earth where creatures take over or something and or there's a monster in the neighborhood or whatever the case may be is they're trapped in their house. and Or at least I can tell they're trapped in their house, but they're completely silent. Like they don't make any noise at all. And they're always fearful of making noise. So they everything about them is sign language. It's, um, uh, you know, if you were putting something down on a table, it's got a big, it has to have something felty on it. So it's not like wood against glass or wood against wood it has to be something soft so that way it doesn't make any noise so everything is silent until they're playing a, playing a game and someone knocks over something and they put it out quickly takes a couple seconds but it's enough they know now the, the monsters know they're there and it looks terrifying and of course if you listen to the j craig you know i'm a pussy when it comes to scary movies but this looks really cool because it doesn't look like just like a scary movie it, it just it's got something else going on it's got that excitement um so i'm looking forward to seeing that so i don't want to bore you with uh month by month by month but that's a good overview of what i saw coming out and i'm sure there's some more uh so now that we got the positive out of the way let's go to the fun stuff let's go to the negative stuff now, I didn't write a whole bunch down here, and I'll start with um, Jurassic World 2. I don't pretty much care for this movie. I don't want to see this movie. Truth be told, when I saw Jurassic World, I really enjoyed it. I actually did. I, it was, like, nostalgic. It had it was exciting, um, and that was about it. And then I went home, never thought about it again, and then when I started thinking about it, it really fell flat. So, I, you know, I've come to realize it's not a good movie, but it's, it does the right things to incite an audience and have an experience. And sometimes that's what movies are made for. I get it. Um, but it didn't didn't do it for me as a, as a movie. But it was fun. 
was fun in the general sense of entertainment and sheer blockbuster kind of fun. Uh, but ultimately, it just didn't resonate with me and something that I uh, was forgotten very easily. And the other thing is, is Chris Pratt. I'm just not a big fan of Chris Pratt. I've said it. I'll say it again. Uh, I'll say it again. I just really don't care for his shtick. The other one is Pacific Rim 2, another sequel. Now, this one I care less about than Jurassic World 2 because I don't know if it is Guillermo del Toro that did the sequel, but I know he did the first one. And I just don't care about the story. Big monsters and big robots is cool. Ah, uh, okay. You know what? It is really cool. It's a really cool idea. Big giant monsters, big giant robots battling each other. It's badass. I mean, that's pretty fucking cool. Uh, I just don't like his execution. I don't like his storytelling. I don't like his. I don't like his movies. And maybe it's because Charlie Hunan is Hunan is the main actor, and Ibris Elba is not in enough. Uh, but I mean, it just doesn't work for me. So I'm really not looking forward to seeing it, but you know what? I would love to go see that movie and be completely surprised. So, uh, that's a chance I'll have to take because the, the idea of big giant monsters and big giant robots is pretty freaking cool. So for those who have listened to the Jay Craig and those astute listeners, you might've noticed that I had, did not list a Star Wars movie, uh, in my most anticipated movies of the year. And there's a reason being is because I'm not looking forward to this movie. I just think it has disaster written all over it. Uh, the um, Everything I've heard about it sounds bad. You brought on two really interesting, unique filmmakers. They started to make a movie that was off the script, that was ad-libbed and more parody. You let them go. You bring on Ron Howard, this the, the blandest of filmmakers out there for me. He's going to get the job done. He's going to do a good job doing it, but his movies just don't have a pulse for me. They're very flat. Uh, I'm afraid they're also going to just give you everything about Han Solo that is mystery. You know, um, we, we know how we got the Falcon, but we're going to see it. We know he met he knew Lando, how we met uh, Chewie, uh, how the Castle Run, meeting Jabba, running into Boba Fett. We're going to see all that. And I'm terrified that it's all going to be jammed into one movie. Um, I also heard the actor, or read that the actor might have not been doing a very good job, but maybe that's because of the, care, uh, the, act, the directors before him uh, that got let go. So I'm just not looking forward to it. Um, and it's not me being a petty fanboy because I didn't like Last Jedi. Um, Han Solo is my favorite character. I, I would love for this movie to be awesome, but I read the books. I read a book of uh, a novel, a, tr a trilogy novel of Han Solo and how he became Han Solo. So I'm all for the idea of it, but I just think it sounds horrible um, on paper anyway. So let's see what happens. But the one thing that I was confident was uh, confident in was the actor, and I cannot pronounce his name, and I'm not going to try to. I'm going to murder it right now. But um, when I saw Hail Caesar, and I knew he was in the movie, when I saw Hail Caesar, which is a horrible movie, but when I saw this guy come on screen, I knew instantly that this was the guy playing Han Solo because he just had swagger, he had character, he had something that I, I, I thought was unique. And I was like, this, this guy might be able to pull it off. All right, let's see what this guy can do. But since then, it just sounds like bad after bad after bad stuff going on. Um, and the other thing is, I'm just, I'm not anticipating it. And that's a problem um, I think when you're talking about uh, oversaturation, when it comes to oversaturation, movies start to lose their luster. So it happens with every genre. And right now we have a superhero thing happening. We had seven superhero movies last year, ladies and gentlemen. Seven superhero movies if you count Lego Batman, which I do because it's a superhero. That's seven. The year before that, we had six. The year before that, we had three. This year, there's eight on the docket. Eight. Not in seven right now in 2019. That's 15 superhero movies in the next two years. That's a bit overkill for me. Now, thankfully, people like the Russos and uh, Tahiki Wahidi are taking charge of different movies and giving them new pulse and new life and making them feel different. And I, I'm, I'm, I'm grateful for that, but I'm just kind of getting tired of it. So when you relate it to Star Wars... There's something happening with... It won't kill it in the same way that superhero movies. You won't have several movies a year, but you're going to have one a year. And there's, there's something that you're going to lose with that. And that's that anticipation or that excitement, that that want for the for the new movie, that yearning for the new movie. Um, there's three things that Star Wars is for me. It's the characters. It's that excitement, that yearning for what's coming next, you know, that, that, that waiting, that anticipation. And then there's the experience of the movie, like I did in the Full Circle podcast. Uh, if you haven't seen it, folks, I was on the Full Circle podcast last week. We did a little talk. I was on there for uh, a few minutes talking about The Last Jedi. And um, Daryl actually was going to ask me about oversaturation and how, if that was going to kill 
you know, the character uh, kill the our, our childhood or if it was going to kill the Star Wars movies. And I don't think it can kill your childhood. You know, you're, that's, that's what you have inside you. That's what's part of you. Those are the memories you have. It can't destroy that. It can't let Kingdom of the Crystal Skull cannot destroy Indiana Jones. It can just want, it can destroy the new movies coming going forward, but it can't kill what we know. It can kill it for the new generation, mind you. Absolutely. But I think if, as children, you know, we have those memories and we're always going to have them. So the saturation won't kill it, but it will affect that anticipation, that that suspenseful buildup before the movie comes out. And that's going to be gone, and that's kind of important to me. That's that's It's a unique part of Star Wars that we didn't always have a Star Wars movie coming out. And you had a lot of time in between to talk about it, think about it, to read the comics, to read the books. And I read a lot of different things about Star Wars in between trilogies because I just... I wanted to keep immersing myself in a world that I didn't get enough out of. But now we're going to get too much of it. And I think it is going to play a factor. Now, I'm not being spiteful because of my hatred for Last Jedi. I'm not. I truly mean this, that if we get... Now that we're going to get one in four months, I can't imagine people getting in line and dressing, so many people dressing up as Han Solo after four months. I mean, it's that anticipation, man, that sense of... Uh, camaraderie with people like it builds that excitement it's going to be gone i think it's going to affect the series in general um going forward i think you're going to have some faults uh some you know it won't have that big i'm not going to be buying tickets three months ahead of time because it's just another star wars movie when force awakens came out i bought tickets three months ahead of time and i bought tickets for four different days in the first weekend just to make sure we could all go see the movie <laughs> i'm an idiot man I'm a, such a nerd, right? So, but I, that's going away, unfortunately. So, but I, in closing of that, I don't think it could kill, you know, that that sense of what we love. And as much as I dislike the Last Jedi, it's I still have Star Wars. It's still what it is. It is what it is for me, right? I saw Split finally, um, and this is after uh, we we had the podcast last time when we did our end of the year review. We talked about Split because it came out in 2017, and I heard so many good things about it. So I finally saw it, and I have to say. Um, fantastic movie. I really enjoyed it. Here's, but here's the reason why. It wasn't because it tied into Unbreakable. It's had a character, something that M. Night has lacked in a lot of his movies recently, is lack of a character that did something meaningful or had, you know, a sense of purpose. Um, it, it had a character who whose character decisions paid off later on. And it told a really good story about a, a young lady who was one of three who's kidnapped and every time she has a chance she freezes and she doesn't act and you it drives you crazy because you're like why didn't you just run why didn't you just open the door why didn't you just do it why 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 and it builds and builds and builds until we start learning more about her through the story and through some nice effectual effective flashbacks we learn that and i'm not going to spoil it for anybody because you're good just you should watch this movie is that we, we we understand why she didn't move, why she froze when she was in, in that kind of situation. And it makes so much sense on why she did what she was doing. But because of that, it made her ending action so much more powerful. A powerful character that has decisions that pay off throughout the movie is something you don't find a lot anymore. And when it's in a movie, it makes you really care about the character. And if you don't care about the character, I'm sorry, you don't have a story. You don't have something worthwhile. So when when I'm watching Split, I'm I'm like it's driving me crazy because she won't act, and I'm sitting there thinking, wow, okay. And then once we start seeing something in her background from her, you know, when she was a child, it starts to come together. You're like, okay, that's why she's freezing. But then once the climax happens, it, it gives us so much more purpose and and feel. And I have to say, I was very impressed uh, with that movie. Um, one that I was not impressed with was the Netflix big budget Bright. So I finally checked it out. It took me about three sittings to do so. Um, I liked Will Smith in it, as always. I mean, he's awesome. Um, but one thing about the movie just didn't just didn't sit right. It takes place in modern day, from what I can tell. But orcs and elves and magic are at play in, in our world. So you have orcs wearing jerseys and football jerseys. And it's just... It just didn't feel right to me. It just felt off. And I had a hard problem with that, a hard time, you know, just getting around that. It just looked kind of cheap that way to me. Um, the other thing is David Ayers. I don't like him as a filmmaker. I don't like him as a storyteller. Uh, he does some, certain things good, and some movies can be good, but just like Suicide Squad, I watched it recently. I tried to, and it's just not a very well-done movie. 
Um, so I, I didn't care for Bright too much, but I liked what it was doing. And I'd, I'd like to see the sequel and see what they do with the story. I have HBO right now, so I watched uh, a little bit of Warcraft. And I mean a little bit, maybe about an hour of it. So a little bit more than a little. Um, I love the the effects look great, but it's all lost on me. I don't know who's what. It didn't engross me in the story. Um, I really didn't care too much about what was going on, even though Ben Foster's in it and he's doing a pretty good job being a sorcerer or a wizard. Um, so I tried watching it. I got about an hour in and that's pretty much all I was able to, to take <laughs> from the Warcraft movie. But it looked really cool. Now, the one I really want to talk about today is one that I put on Facebook uh, not too long ago, and it's something that I just discovered this past Friday, and that is Philip K. Dick's Electric Dreams on Amazon. And I was stunned when I saw this pop up on my screen. I had no idea it was it existed. So I immediately started watching it. My wife, Tina, was with me, watched the first episode, and I discovered, surprisingly and happily, that it's not just one long show. It's episodic in nature. So every episode is very different from the other. Uh, different actors, characters, directors, um, settings, everything, right? So I was like, oh, this is very cool. So if you don't know who Philip K. Dick is... And if you've seen Blade Runner or Total Recall or Minority Report or uh, Scanners, uh, gosh, there's so many more that he is uh, that he has written in either a short story or as a novel. Uh, Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep is a Philip K. Dick Philip K. Dick novel that was turned into Blade Runner. Uh, Total Recall Terminator has a story that is very similar to Philip K. Dick short stories. Um, and what's really interesting about Philip K. Dick's stories, and I don't know a lot about them, I only know what I've read from his work, but they all kind of seem to deal with this one theme, which is, uh, what's real, what's not real. The subconscious versus the conscious, you know, the, the subconscious versus consciousness and, you know, this, these two sides of, of android versus human, and there's all these different, uh, themes at play, but they're all very similar to what's real and what's not real. So if you are a fan of uh, the Black Mirror, which is most recent up until this point, uh, which is really badass. Uh, by the way, if uh, if you have not seen Black Mirror, check, your, check it out on Netflix. And I recommend watching episode two of both season one and two first. Those two, those two episodes are phenomenal. And if you don't get hooked by that point, don't worry about it. The first season is only three episodes. Second season is only like four or five. So it's not like they're long, long seasons, but the one they started with in season one just didn't, like if I would have watched that first, I would have been like, oh, uh, I don't know if I want to watch this anymore. But the second second episode was awesome. So it's very Twilight Zone-ish. It's very, um, you know, Outer Limits kind of style. So every episode's got a different story it's telling. And uh, the Black Mirror does something really unique with technology and it's like it's like a indictment on humanity and where we're headed and where our love of technology and how it's going to be ingrained in who we are in the future um but electric dreams is different because it deals with um lots of different futuristic worlds some present some not present or uh, modern some not modern but it's all dealing with this subconsciousness of the real and the not real and i think it's very unique in that way and if you like like i said uh, Outer Limits, Twilight Zone, or uh, Black Mirror, do check out Philip K. Dick's Electric Dreams on Amazon. It is so worth it. I'm four episodes in, and you have really good acting uh, and good casting. There's an episode with Brian Cranston, one with Steve Buscemi, one with Terrence Howard, and uh, I forgot her name in the other in the other scene there. Um, so very cool, and I, ha- I can't wait to watch more of it, but I also recommend watching one episode at a time because it is a lot to take. It's a lot of information coming at you. And so one episode I think is enough and then watch the next one the next day. Um, I once read a really cool um, excerpt or excerpt, a bunch of stories called The Wasteland, Tales from the Wasteland and one about zombies. But it was a bunch of authors who wrote individual separate stories that related to either the wasteland or the post the zombie apocalypse right and so you had all these t- you know tales from one from stephen king one from uh god i couldn't even tell you who uh uh george rr R. um miller right is that his name oh my dear god i'm an idiot i don't do my research At any rate um very cool collection of stories that are all in the same world that's what this is so highly recommend it do check it out on netflix or i'm sorry on amazon 
Well, folks, that's going to do it for today. I hope you enjoyed this abbreviated version of the J. Craig podcast. I hope to get Craig back and running here very soon so we can do a proper podcast in the very near future. Uh, Thank you, everyone, for listening, no matter if it's from SoundCloud, YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, iTunes, or whatever else I'm missing there. Uh, We love that you're listening. Keep on doing that. Next time you get a chance, go to thejcraig.com and check out my new section, What Jay's Thinking, which will be about a weekly, give or take. Uh, Might do a little bit more than weekly, but I'm going to try to do it at least weekly update on what's coming out, uh, different things I might be uh, wanting to talk about, and just what's generally on my mind. So, uh, folks, above all, keep on listening. We'll keep talking.